Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. Thank you for taking time in your busy day to watch our videos. Friends, we are thankful for those who do comment, those who give us likes, and those who have subscribed. Friends, we need subscribers on YouTube. We need to get our number up to 100. Once we get up to 100 subscribers, we can expand this outreach onto another video platform that therein we might reach more people for the gospel's sake, the truth. So let me encourage you, my friends, if you watch these videos, if you believe what we're telling you, if you believe the truth and it means something to you, and you believe in being evangelistic, being missionary to reach the people of this world with the gospel and with the truth, and help us to do so by subscribing to the YouTube channel so that we can get our numbers up, so that we can expand this missionary work to other video platforms, or another one, that is, and that's Odyssey. Uh, we'll be able to expand to that once we get over 100 uh, subscribers, and they will automatically uh, transfer the last 30 videos, what I understand, over to that platform. Pray for this ministry that the Lord will help us as we have also expanded into other areas. And we are seeing a definite increase in God's blessing. More and more people are being able to hear and to follow along in these studies which we're doing. Now in this study of the history of the faith here, my friends, and the study of the preservation of God's Word as we are considering it here, we read through this list of rules that the Jewish scribes use when copying the Word of God from one scroll, as it were, in those days, books now, from that original to a new copy. The copy of the Word of God from the old book, the old scroll, to a new book, a new scroll. It is still Scripture. It is still the Word of God. And the diligence which we have read here of these things, and we want to begin to we'll read this first. All of these rules have relation to both accuracy and attitude. Some of these rules may seem odd, but it's because of the meticulous care that we have an Old Testament, we can take 100% assurance of the preservation at its finest. We can have 100% assurance in our hearts and minds that the Old Testament is preserved without error. And that these scribes, and the evidence of that, and of those who, modern scholars in the recent century or two, who wanted to argue, well, that's some, some stuff in Isaiah and other places. Well, that, well we think that was added in, in the time after Christ, in that first century even. And that's why some of them say that the canon of the Old Testament was not settled until the first century A.D. is because they don't believe that those Old Testament verses that so plainly point to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior were there. That they were, they believe they were added by scribes later, and for a scribe, for any scribe to add to the word of God or take away from the word of God showed his lack of respect for his work and for the God of Israel. The Dead Sea Scrolls proved them wrong. Every chapter, every verse, every word of Isaiah was there in those copies. Two copies, as I understand it. In those Dead Sea Scrolls, showing, and once we get up to that time period, we'll be going over that also. We'll be talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything that's contained in them. We get to the time when it was found. Now, in these things, these rules that were given, that affected the Jews, and all Jews believing the Old Testament, believing that which was given, that is what is viewed as the Old Testament. They believe him, that's the word of God. The problem is, after Christ and the new books that began to come on the scene, the New Testament books, and then you have your division. You have the Jewish scribes that were saved, that believed, yes, that Jesus was the Son of God, and they began to accurately pen and copy those New Testament books. And then you had the Jewish scribes 
who, well, they weren't so sure about that Jesus. They didn't believe in those miracles which were said of him. Uh, matter of fact, they went so as far as to accuse him of witchcraft, black magic even, which shows that he was doing some miraculous things, and they knew it. But they wanted to accuse him of being of the devil, of Be 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 Beelzebub. And that's hard to say that. Beelzebub. They did not believe in him. They did not believe that he was the only begotten Son of God. They did not believe that he was God, Emmanuel, God with us. They did not believe that. They didn't believe that those miracles he did were of God. They, you know, by their own statements, their knowledge, he did miracles. And because they did not believe in him, and then these books began to come into their hands, say, hey, we need you to copy this New Testament book. Yeah, they didn't like what they read in there. They didn't like what they saw in there. So they began to alter and change it. And my friends, that scribal work came out of Egypt. You cannot trust anything that comes out of Egypt. And there's coming a time when we get into this study, and later on we're going to preach, uh, get, uh, set forth some things, some stories, a tale of two cities. Two places where the Word of God come from. And then following that, there'll be a tale of two witnesses that we will deal with. That being that as even as two witnesses, they sought two witnesses to stand against the Lord. And they could not get two witnesses to agree. So then they just eventually gave up on that and just, you know, they asked him something. He said something, oh, you blasphemed. And they went with that. They became their own witnesses. Tale of two witnesses, that being of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. They are two witnesses that do not these things are coming in the far future. We haven't even got to that yet in our church study. We're ways off from that. We're about uh, 60, 80 years ahead from where we are here. Actually, more than that, we're in the we're in the 16th century here. A study there, we're in the 17th century. We're over 100 years ahead of it now uh, from where we're at here in 1516, roughly, when the Greek manuscripts began to be brought together and put together in one book. And we're talking about the preservation of the Word of God and now we read these rules last time. We want to think upon these today. The rules of preservation that the scribes, the Jewish scribes, the tribe of Levi, what they went by when copying the Word of God. First of all in Rule 1, we read there and it says the parchment must be made from the skin of a clean animal Clean meaning, ceremonial clean according to the Old Testament sanitary laws must be prepared by a Jew only and skins must be fastened together by strings taken again from clean animals. The, and the inks, uh, the first that one there uh, deals with that. Those, and again, it had to be done by a Jew. They would not. Uh, friends, this shows their dedication, the importance of this to them that they would not even trust someone else who may come up a gent Gentile merchant who might come up and say, here, I've got, I've got skins, they're, they're clean, they're from clean animals. No, they couldn't trust him. They would not trust him to provide such an important thing. It had to be done by them. It had to be from clean animals. There was a, by that, it means of that list of animals which they could not touch and they could not eat. It could not come from those animals. So we have that diligence there. In reference to the words in each column, rule number two, each column must be no less than 48 and no more than 60 lines. That's your range. The, from 48 to 60 lines, it had to be. That kept the spacing right as it went out. And uh, rule three refers to the ink. The ink must be of no pithier color than black. And it must be prepared according to specific recipe, that certain color. Had to be that certain color of black that it be used in this work. No word nor letter could be written from memory. The scribe must have an authentic copy before him, and he must read and pronounce aloud each word before writing it. You know, uh, over the years there have been many men of God, by their knowledge, oh, they could quote a lot. And that's a good thing. That shows forth 
but friends, we're not all that's that sure and that's uh, that able. Uh, yeah, some things I can quote, but I fear as we grow older, and we need to understand this: as we grow older, there's more of a tendency to quote it wrong. So I prefer to try to read everything I'm going to deliver to people. Uh, I read it, read it verse by verse, word by word. And even the, even sometimes in friends, uh, I see what's there in the mind, uh, you know, just like, you know, we find ourselves skipping a line or getting words out of order, but, you know, it really takes focus and to concentrate on what's before so we might accurately set it before the people. They had this diligence that, again, this being so that they get it right, because, they, well, I know what that says, so they jot down a line or two by memory and then look and say, well, how did I do that? You know, and they'd, you know, they very easily could realize then that they've got something out of order, that they skipped something, they uh, added something. So they had to look at it. They had to say it, and then they wrote it. Look, say it, write it. Look, say it, write it. That's the diligence which was put into preserving of the Old Testament canon the Old Testament books of the Word of God. Number five, he must re reverently wipe his pen each time before writing the Word God, which is the name Elohim. And this is the primary, and when you see God in the Old Testament, just about, uh, this is old, most of them. There might be uh, another word or two in there, there's a couple other names in there that were used for God. But, the overwhelming majority of the word God is the, the Hebrew word Elohim. And Elohim, my friend, speaks of the Trinity of God. Elo meaning one and Him meaning more than one. So we have many in one. Trinity, the us. So let us make God in our image, the us, the are, the plurality of God. The plurality of the Godhead is right here in this very name of God which is given to us from the beginning and the work of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, when it says, God, Elohim, Elohim, Elohim said, let there be light. Elohim spoke. And these things came to pass. He is God. He is a multiplicity uh, of a, a, a union of more than one person in the Godhead. That very name itself declares that. For you that don't understand, believe these things. But of this, and again, every time they were going to write down Elohim or God, they had to wipe the pen. And he must wash his whole body before writing the name Jehovah. And Jehovah in our King James Bible, I think we have it one or two times, Jehovah. But every other time, all the other times, it's the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. All four letters capitalized. There's how they make the distinction of Jehovah in our King James Bible. Modern Bibles do not do this. So that his holy name might be not contaminated. They had to wash their body. Every time. Now I don't remember exactly right off how many times that's in your Bible. Uh... The word search programs I got, I don't think will separate that out. Uh, there's one I've seen another gentleman online using that will separate according to so many other different parameters and things. And uh, I think it's free. I really need to get it, I guess. But uh, the word searches and things that he can do with that are just amazing. But their diligence in this, my friends. This is their faith. This is their their obedience unto God and their faith unto God that every time they would see that and come up and oh there it is again there's Jehovah and they would go and they would cleanse themselves they go wash their whole body and then come back and write down Jehovah and then go on it could be in uh, maybe a verse or two later well there it is again and they go again and wash their whole body and come back and again write down Jehovah Again, my friends, let me say this to you. It is the foolishness of modern times, the foolishness of scribes in our day, and of these, even some of this from these Jewish people who are coming forth to all the J sound didn't exist then. 
Do they not call Jerusalem? Jerusalem? They haven't replaced that with a Y. If Jehovah is not Jehovah, then Jerusalem is not Jerusalem. My friends, these who have come on the scene in this century, in these last 50 to 100 years, and I suspect that it's within the last 50 years and not farther back, because I know in the early days of my life, in the early days of my ministry, there was no one going around saying, Oh, it's Yahweh. Oh, it's Yeshua. No, it's Jesus. And it's Jehovah. And we need to hold to these things. We need to hold to the traditions of our faith, the teachings of our faith. And not let these modern people persuade us contrary to what we've been given in the scriptures, the word of God. Friends, let me warn you, I see this, it's, it's running rampant amongst the faith. It's running even in the midst of Baptists that we are turning from what this book says and we're accepting the ideas and opinions of men of this modern age. They don't believe this is the word of God. They don't believe this has the power and the authenticity of the originals as they would speak of them. Friends, this is the word of God. It's the Bible. In our language, in the English, this King James Bible is the Word of God. It's Scripture. It's worthy of all acceptation. We ought to believe it. We ought to be obedient unto it. That diligent, that reverence which they had to God and His Word, we ought to have that same reverence. Now, uh, there was another name for God that they would not speak, and I'm not sure that it's one of those two. But there was a name for God they would not speak. Maybe it was Jehovah, maybe it was something else. I'm not sure about that right offhand. It's come to mind. But still yet, there are, there's more than two names of God given in the Old Testament. But those are two prominent ones that we refer to here in these rules. Six, again, was a strict rule where, where the strict rules were given concerning forms of letters, spaces between letters, words, and sections, and use of the pen, the color of the parchment. Etc. Strict rules on how the letters had to look and the, even the spacing. And this was so that everything would fall in line, column by column, they would all fall right in line. You couldn't, they couldn't pack them tighter together and put more words, put more letters in a line. It would throw everything off. My friends, that Hebrew is just letter by letter by letter by letter. If you don't know how to, you don't know where one word begins, where, uh, where one word ends, where another begins. And the Greek is much the same way, that you cannot look at that and say, well, here's the beginning and there's the end. These things all run together. They had strict rules on how that was to be written down to keep it in line, to keep it column by column, word by word, book by book. The revision or the correction of errors, if there were errors, and yes, certainly it's the tendency of man to make errors. That's why they had such strict rules. To, provide, to try to prevent the errors from coming into play. Again, it's said in, verse, in Rule 7, the revision or the correction of any errors of a roll must be made within 30 days after the work was finished. Otherwise, it was worthless. One, mis one mistake on a sheet condemned the entire sheet. If three mistakes were found on a page, the entire manuscript was condemned. Now, in this here, we see a modernized condition. We see it coming from a scroll to a codex, to a book form, because it's talking about individual sheets here, that certain number of mistakes for a sheet. And again, you would have those two columns, most likely, on one page there. And if there be a certain number of mistakes found in just a short space, it would condemn the whole writing, and it would have to be destroyed. Every word in Rule 8, every word in every letter was counted. And if a letter was omitted, or if any extra letters were in inserted, or if two letters touched one another, the manuscript was condemned and destroyed at once. Now in this, they would have the scribes that were making the copies, and they'd have someone that was an overseer over them, and someone who would come back and check the work, and that's what it talks about in 30 days, that the, the one who was doing the checking, 
that was watching over and checking the work of these scribes, they had a certain amount of time that they had to do it. And if it couldn't be done at time again, that would make that manuscript worthless. It would be destroyed by the rules. And if again, if they found a certain number of errors, it would be worthless. It would be destroyed by the rules. Now the, these are manuscripts again this affects the scrolls and the books that were done in the, uh, the not the, not the animal skin now but the the paper what we might call paper today that made of the plants and this is a distinction my friends we need to make that when it comes to the vellum to the animal skin the animal skin was reusable and they did reuse it somewhat as long as it was still clean clean looking it was white and clean it could be reused and they bleached it also as they clean it they were bleaching it cleaning off all the ink and that's what's wrong with the story that was told that a man said he found parchments he found animal skin manuscript and oh it was going to be burned it was going to be used to start the fire even my friends that is not possible animal skin does not burn very well at all and it's certainly not something you'd use to start a fire. Uh, it would be an awful smell as well. But the fact that it was reusable. Even, yes, in that day, it was reusable. In that eight, uh, 1800s, 19th century, it was reusable. It would be reused. As long as it was still, the quality was good enough there, they could reuse it. Which is evident by one of the codexes found. Because it was obviously old parchment skins that already had holes eaten in it by those insects, those worms. And when the man copied the letters, he went right around the holes. Whereas in the old copies, the holes go right through the letters. Eat right through them. There's the proof of the pudding, is it not? We'll deal with that later also. Every word, rule eight, every word and every letter was counted. And if a letter was omitted or if an extra letter was inserted or if two letters touched one another, the manuscript was condemned and destroyed at once. It had to be, if it was the, the uh, made from the plants, it would be burned up and destroyed. It made from animal skins. It could be cleansed. It could be, uh, they could wipe it away. They could clean off the ink and reuse it. That's how they would destroy it. They would not preserve it. Matter of fact, it is the witness that we have heard through one of the men of God online as he talked to one of the monasteries over there in that part of the world. They said, no, that they did not keep irregular manuscripts. They did not keep them. They destroyed them. That counting of letters, see, they knew. They knew exactly how many letters there should be from beginning to end. And there was a midway point in a book, in every book, a midway point where if they knew counting in, it should be so many letters. Counting from the end back into it should be so many letters. They had all so many overlapping things here to keep the work preserved and accurate as they copied, 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 copied. And Dead Sea Scrolls proved that copy, copying process to be such a quality that it, it rivals even what we do today. As we have people who uh, do the data work and they're transferring data over and uh, they can't even get your address right. I've had that problem. I have a medical bill that winds up going somewhere else because someone transferring my information over from the computer over to this. They transcribe, they transpose the numbers and it winds up going somewhere else. I'm sure others have had that problem too. But the Word of God has been preserved. It's been preserved in this. That we have and should have. We should understand this. That our Old Testament is 100% reliable. And these modern thinkers, these modern scribes, whether they be of the Jewish persuasion or whether they be Gentiles who have come on the scene and say, Oh, but yeah, there's a problem with that Old Testament copy. Oh, they messed up somewhere. 
they got the wrong words, they got the wrong this is wrong and that's wrong. Do not listen to them, my friends. Do not listen to them. Oh, I don't care what kind of credentials they say they have. Oh, but I've got my letters, I've got my doctorate, I've studied, I've been taught. And therein lies the problem. They've been taught to think that it is in error. God help us not to follow such foolish men who have allowed themselves to be taught by scholars in these institutions that the Word of God is full of error, that somewhere back there, somewhere, someone made a mistake and it wasn't corrected, it was passed on down, and more mistakes were made and it was passed on down. Do not believe them, my friends. They're lying to you. The diligence of these Jewish scribes and still yet the Masoretic texts that are being copied and preserved from the time of Christ up to now even. Their diligence has been there to preserve the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and they have done it. And they preserve a few other things also that perhaps have been better than they had. And that's those apocrypha books. They preserve them too. And not because they believe they were the word of God. Friends, moving on from this in next week's video we will begin to look at what Jesus had to say, the testimony of Christ in regards to the uh, Old Testament. That which Jesus had before him. When Jesus read from the book, read from the Old Testament, did he not say that it was the scriptures? Did he not refer to it as scriptures? That shows us something, that the original of Scripture, the copy of the copy of the copy of the copy is Scripture, as long as it's done right. But if uh, just a few mistakes are made, that's enough to destroy it and to, to have it done away with. What Jesus read of Scripture, what Paul said that Timothy had from his youth up of Scripture, what Paul had, he said, bring unto me the Scriptures, I might read them scriptures, not given by men, but given by inspiration of God. The holy men of old penned it down. They wrote it down as God said, write it down. God breathed into them that which he'd have them write down. But we come and we'll, we'll get, begin to get in that. We'll talk about the 400 years of silence. Friends, 400 years before the time of Christ, the last book was wrote. The last book of the Bible. The last book of the Old Testament, that is. The last book was wrote. There's 400 years of silence. The canon was established there, 400 years before Christ. It was not altered. It was not added to. It was not changed. It was dil diligently copied and scribed for those 400 years by the scribes of Israel. Insomuch that the copies that were found that were roughly about 100 years before Christ were perfectly preserved. No more, not, not enough change there to be brought forth to be mentioned even. That's what we'll find about those Dead Sea Scrolls. Friends, let me say to you again, we appreciate each of you that listen and watch these videos, especially you that are commenting. Those of you who have uh, contacted us personally through the sources that are, which are available. You can write to us. You can uh, send messages. And those we talk to locally, that follow, and follow along and listen to these things. We're thankful for all of you. And we pray that God would help us all to be contending for the faith in the days which we still yet have. Friends, we're out of time. May God keep you and bless you, my friends, until we meet again.